this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are celebrating the start of March by talking mid-major men's college basketball tournament betting with Andy Molitor of BetSports and getting his thoughts on some of those conference outrights. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com and Ed Today is day number one of your Bracket Wisdom podcast series, so I'm shocked that you're here because it feels <laughs> like you should be like sleeping, hibernating something because that's just a lot of work, a podcast every day until the tournament begins. So, the, well, I mean, I, I appreciate that. It, it's actually been quite lovely this year. I've done them mostly myself. I uh, started two years ago, nearly died um, <laughs> last year, got halfway through, and then COVID happened. Yep. And then uh, it was interesting because it was kind of a relief to not have to do the last three or four episodes because <laughs> I wasn't feeling so well with COVID. Right. So, <laughs> but uh, this year, uh, hired Edward Egros to help me out. So he's been doing some excellent episodes. And Jim, I, you know, I actually haven't felt more relaxed at this point in March since I started working in the sports business. So Edward's helping me out. I don't have travel to Boston to Sloan this year. It's true. Yeah. I was like, going to ask why, but I guess the combination of having the helping hand in Edward, a, a very helpful helping hand, uh, and not having Sloan, I guess that does make a pretty big difference. In, yeah, it makes a big difference. Uh, you know, I mean, talk to me in two weeks and it'll be a different story. <laughs> but right now I'm feeling pretty good. So... Um, I think the Sloan aspect of that is big because it's not just being at the conference all day. You are on, like... You are mentally locked in for 15, 16, 17 hours each day yeah. that you're there. And that adds up a lot, especially when it leads into this this big work time of year for you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's kind of intense. It's definitely fun. Don't yeah. get me wrong. It's, it's, it's a great time going there. But um, yeah, it's intense. It is. You, you do need to be on and there's kind of no break. I mean, I, I often don't ever call my family during those two or three <laughs> days. So yeah, so there's there's none of that. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. I actually made some reservations, uh, for, uh, a dinner in Detroit for my birthday next Sunday, Nice, it, it, you know, so just not having Sloan and, you know, my wife's been, uh, not super excited about eating out, but this place is in a hotel and they're using the hotel rooms as kind of private dining. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. So it's super cool. Uh, what's the, what's the food? What do you, what is the birthday meal of choice for Ed? Well, this place is called Apparatus Room. The food is absolutely phenomenal. It's right across the right across the street from the TF, TCF Center down in Detroit. The chef was a two-star Michelin chef in Chicago before he decided to come home. Uh, it's it's really good. Detroit has phenomenal food. Yeah, way better than you would ever think. It's phenomenal. I have not been outside of the airport, and I don't think the airport counts. So I'll have the to make a trip out there. Awful. Bed. I, I that's it's universal awful. though universal truth that airport well, food is awful well san francisco they had kind of been making some inroads and having some sushi places and it wasn't awful but see that requires me to travel west of south dakota which has happened twice <laughs> in my entire life so maybe it's just me it's not it's not the airports maybe it's just me that right. needs to well, you know venture out west a bit more i was supposed to go to la like a year ago that didn't happen, obviously, but, you right. know, would have been time number three. But we'll get to that at some – I guess it's four, three times because I've been to San Diego twice and L.A. once. But um, we'll hopefully add to that number post-vaccination. We're going to talk to Andy Molitor today. You can follow him on Twitter at AndyMSFW. You know him as the co-host of the Deep Dive podcast, but he's also now the director of content for BetSports. You can get his analysis there for free at BetSports. Uh, follow the name Andy for his daily analysis there. You can also follow BetSperts on Twitter, at BetSperts. We're going to talk to Andy about men's college basketball, uh, the small conference, mid-major tournaments, get his thoughts on a couple of tournaments already under underway and some that are starting later on this week. Follow Andy on Twitter, at AndyMSFW. We're going to have plenty of podcasts coming up talking about men's college basketball for the next couple of weeks, so make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating 
rating and review as well. We'll get to Andy here in just one sec, but first we have to go back to last week. We talked some golf and covering the future, and we came close, but no cigar on Brooks Kepka. Covering the past. So last week you were uncovering the spread. We were talking about the WGC Workday Championship for golf, and I like Brooks Kepka and gave it a good run. Kepka was 27 to 1 when we talked about him on Wednesday. He closed at 20 to 1. A large part of that was because Patrick Cantley withdrew, but you know, still good value, good move there for Brooks Kepka to beat the closing number. And he gave it a run, man. Kepka actually entered the weekend leading. He was up on Friday, but Colin Morikawa went just nuts on Saturday. He entered Sunday with a two-shot lead over Kepka. Kepka slow start Sunday. He was out of bounds on his first tee shot on one. Not a great start there. Made bogey there. He did claw back. Got a couple of birdies in the back nine. He shot a 70 for the day, but Morikawa shot a 69 to get the win. So a second place finish for Brooks. I am happy with the process. Happy with how he did, even if the, the bet did not win. But I also actively said, don't bet other markets because he's too volatile. And if you had bet the top three or top five, you would have had the the cash on Kepka there. But regardless, I feel okay with it personally. Uh, Brooks didn't quite hit a 27-1, to but getting closer. And it feels like we are on the verge of something good here. Uh, just not quite in that one for Brooks Kepka. Ed, you said you had it on the background over the weekend? Yeah, uh, Jim, you're proud of me. I actually engaged in watching either golf or, or NASCAR this weekend. It, this uh, this being golf, uh, we had it on while I was watching Iowa uh, at Ohio State yesterday. So, And I saw Kepka was on the leaderboard. I wish I hadn't watched NASCAR uh, <laughs> because it was... It was rough, man. Uh, it was rough. So I'm glad we stuck to Kepka for covering the future last week. And hopefully you did go against my advice and bet it on outright. But uh, NASCAR, not as fun by any means. So we'll be talking baseball for my covering the future later today uh, for sure. Before we get to that, though, we do have to uh, bring in Andy Malter to talk some mid-major men's college basketball. But first, FanDuel Sportsbook and Mountain Dew are teaming up to bring you more ways to win this NBA season with the 2021 Mountain Dew Super Tray Day Sportsbook 3-point bonus. Say that 15 times fast because I can't say it once. Any fan who places a bet of at least $25 on a player to score the first basket in any game on March 3rd will be eligible to receive $3 in bonus cash for every single three-point shot made by their selected first basket score. Have a feeling that Portland will catch fire against Golden State? Simply bet on a player to score the first basket of the game and collect $3 in bonus cash every time he hits a three. March 3rd is coming up on Wednesday, so download the FanDuel Sportsbook app and get in to place your bets today. Must be 21 plus and present in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Bonus issued as a non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max bonus $25. Terms apply. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado. In Iowa, call 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In, in Michigan, for confidential help, 1-800-270-7117. In New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER. In Tennessee, call the Tennessee Red Line, 1-800-889-9789. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's get to Andy Molitor now. Again, find him on Twitter at, at, at AndyMSFW and check him out on the Deep Dive podcast. Also, uh, check him out as the director of content over at BetSperts and get all of his analysis for free at BetSpurt, BetSperts under the name Andy for his daily analysis. We're going to talk some men's college basketball mid-majors and get you set with March officially now underway. Covering the present. Let's bring Andy Molitor into covering the spread to preview the mid-major men's college basketball tournaments. Andy, we had you on the show last year, and a week and a half later, everything shut down. So are you nervous about doing the show again, or do you feel like (laughs) there's a situation where we have to exercise the demons and have you back on to, to make everything right in the universe once again? Yeah, hopefully the latter. I don't think I was the cause. Like, Was I the gym? I do remember that. And it, and yeah, it was, uh, I've said this to somebody I said, you know, it was a weird, obviously super weird, but like the, the next week I saw a bunch of my accounts go up because all these futures I'd already placed right. got refunded and you know, I'm betting them at actually post up books. So I got some money back and, you know, I, I did go back and I looked at how last year went, we got more, it, something in my mind was like, 
saying that we didn't do very much, but we, we got like six or seven tournaments to completion, I think, maybe even more. So it was kind of midway through, but it, yeah, that was rough. It was no fun when everything came to a screeching halt and I realized my Vegas trip was off, all my, a, a lot of previews. And I mean, you too, you guys, yeah. and I'm, Ed, you do, a, a, I don't have to tell you guys, Ed does a ton of work for, uh, you know, March Madness, all that work you put in. And it's just like, oh, man, I did a lot for nothing. And this, this everything about this sucks. So hopefully, yeah, things are tre- things are trending right this way. Yeah, so yeah. I think we're going to be just fine. And it should be a fun March. And yeah, there should be a great appetite for it this year. Well, I remember last year we were planning for our bracket podcast and our co-host Keith Goldner was at a conference. He was going to be at a conference. He had a speaking engagement. So we're like, okay, we need to plan the timing around when this conference is. Then it was like, oh, the conference got canceled. So we can, we can have Keith on whenever. And then it's like, nope, doesn't matter. There's no tournament. So definitely a weird year. Uh, hopefully this year is a bit more smooth, but we'll see. It seems like things are going pretty well so far. And actually... Some of the conference tournaments already underway, so at least we've got that uh, at least started here. Now, Andy, before we talk about, you know, actually betting these tournaments, how have things been going for you this year in college basketball, given that it's definitely different uh, with all the, the postponements and stuff like that? How have things been going for you personally on the college basketball side of things? Yeah, a little tricky, just like everything else, just like college football in the fall and you know, uh, the NFL had some stuff move around. I suppose we didn't actually have cancellations, but that's that's been the biggest uh, source of like, you know, just grief for me is, oh, I get a bunch of closing line value. This number moved like two points. My oh, that game's getting canceled. But they're not <laughs> playing that tonight. And you know, the the one that moves against me, oh, that's certainly happening. It doesn't matter if contact <laughs> tracing or not. So, you, you know how that goes. But it, it has been a, a pain as far as and Twitter's pretty good about that. They're usually, hey, guess what? That game's not happening. Oh, thanks for the heads up. I won't look for that score now because uh, it, it hasn't happened a ton. But I think the biggest challenge has been you know, putting some numbers together and then adjusting them for teams that have taken a break, an extended break. There's teams that have had like 40 days between games and come back. You know, obviously teams like Maine and a couple other squads, the Ivy League in general just didn't even play, you know, but there's teams that just shut it down and said, we're, we're done. But there's teams that, you know, that they've taken two week, three week longer breaks and then come back and played. And you get a mixed bag of results when a team comes off break. You have to dig in like, were they actually practicing? Were they allowed to practice at all? That's where, you know, a lot of this, you know, research and stuff I haven't had to do in years prior has come into play, I guess. So it's it's been interesting to say the least. We're on the, we're on the right side of zero. So I'm happy in that so- regard. And hopefully it keeps going here. Andy, what what has kind of been your average adjustment for a team coming off a two week break? Say like a Baylor on on Saturday night. Well, I guess they played a game before that, but what 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 has kind of been your average adjustment? I mean, truthfully, a lot of the average adjustment is just not to bet on them. You know, if, if I'm <laughs> if I I mean if I'm yeah, being honest, fair. it's just like I gotta wipe it away. Like I can't play this game for the most part if I can't find any actual evidence that they practiced. Because there's been a few of these where it's like they just sat in their dorm rooms for like two weeks, you know, taking right. some online classes and didn't didn't handle a ball. And then you throw them back out there in a conference game and you've seen some, I mean, up your way, you saw what Michigan State looked like when they came back. I mean, there's been some yeah. absolute stinkers from some teams that took some breaks. So if it's a yeah. team playing against a team off a break, I'm fine with that. But some of these I've had to just say, I can't play this team tonight. I have to see how they respond coming back or maybe I'll play a second half. Cause it's, it's, it's been kind of rough watching some of these teams get back on the court. And the tough thing about that is you were talking about digging in to try to find whether the team has been practicing, you're looking for information and that's readily available for a lot of the bigger programs, but the teams we're talking about today are mostly mid majors and There's obviously good beat reporting around those teams, but it's not as abundant necessarily as you'd have for some of the bigger programs. So have you been able to find that information for the smaller schools, or has that been a bigger issue for you digging into these smaller schools, try to find that information for them? Yeah, and it's definitely tougher. I'm sure there's a few situations where it's like this team has been practicing, they're ready to go, and I just can't find 
actual evidence of that. But yeah, like I'm going on uh, Teams Twitter account. I spent enough time on Twitter as it is. I'm going to <laughs> team, you know, these small conferences, their Teams Twitter accounts, they're a lot of them have like their managers team accounts. They'll have, you know, conference accounts. You can find, you know, just the athletics account for that um, that particular program and like Santa Clara a few weeks back kind of rings a bell like I, I was able to find some information like oh they're practicing i'm gonna i'm gonna back them off a break here I'm, I'm fine with this the number's big enough and but i mean if i wouldn't have found out they had been practicing i probably would have passed on that and i, I think that game even won so no it's 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 been a challenge it's a lot more time and involved than i'm used to but it's been fun too as far as when you do find a nugget like that it feels pretty good <laughs> that's awesome so Andy, I think we can all agree that there's more uncertainty this college basketball season. Does that make you want to bet uh, conference winners, or maybe stick more to individual games? So I usually, I usually still do game by game, and I, I will through these conference tournaments. You know, a game's a game. There's a little more of situational with uh, some of these. Not everybody does it, but some of these conferences just want to get these tournaments run through so quick even in normal years where they'll they'll be back to back to back games like i think the summit league is similar to that where they they do things like that some leagues give you long breaks like the horizon league tournament takes two and a half weeks for some reason so i mean a little more a little more situational stuff but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna shy away from some of these conference futures just it's been a lot of fun doing this the past couple of years putting together some previews and taking some shots in a few of these leagues uh it's and now there, there's more sports books out i mean that there's just there's more options i've actually had more trouble finding some odds this year which is wild but there's there's uh you know there's more options up there's more especially with these prices if you do shop around a little sometimes you can find some odd prices or sometimes shopping is you're shopping just to find anybody with a price but uh i i definitely have i think i've been able to find some value so far so hopefully you know going forward i'll people will put prices up for all these tournaments and you know the, the big ones are up you know, I, I popped over to FanDuel earlier today and looked in, you know, Mountain West plus some of the other big, big conferences, which is they don't even have seating figured out in some of those and they're putting prices up. So respect on that. But, uh, yeah, I will I'll be playing conference tournament futures for sure. Absolutely. And we do have uh, a couple of tournaments underway here. So let's talk about those. You know, obviously we don't have like odds for these at FanDuel Sportsbook necessarily, but we do want to talk some Big South because there are actually some games tonight. We're talking to you Monday afternoon. So if you're listening, you know, post-Monday afternoon, um, you can skip past this part, but four games on tap for Monday afternoon. Uh, Winthrop the one seed. Any value for you, Andy, in those games specifically or any value in, in anyone to knock off Winthrop in the Big South? Well, I don't think Winthrop's going to lose this one. I did bet against him against the spread here. This opened much i think it's not maybe down to 12 and a half at the point where we're recording here i bet some 14 and a half on high point they're not a good team but it's just a lot of points <laughs> and there is something to be said about tournament play while you know the big south they aren't back to back to back like there is something to be said for we don't need to win by 30 we've got another very important game we've got a semifinal game coming up there's a titch of signal in that and my power numbers just can't get this quite out to 14 so i did bet against winthrop in the in the the initial odds for the Big South, Winthrop was a prohibitive favorite. I didn't lay that number either. I have some long shots on the other side of the bracket. So hopefully, and I did say, I said Gardner-Webb is the sixth seed, Campbell's the three seed. They're doing seeding oddly this year. And some of these seeds are not going to be indicative of just how these teams should be power rated because um, there's going to be conferences that are using net rating, which – I don't think they've ever done before. There's going to be <laughs> conferences or they're just going to be using all sorts of things because there's what? going to be situations where they're not having the same amount of games. Uh -oh. and it's a struggle to, I mean, that, that's why I heard Ed kind of chuckle at the net rating net rating. I know everybody and I will agree. There is some flaws with net rating. I am not a hundred percent behind a lot of it. I get the general idea. It's not the worst system in the world, but, and, and truthfully, we're just seeding a conference tournament. It's not, you know, right. we're not, not <laughs> it's not world peace, but the, and <laughs> they don't have a lot of options here because there's teams that have played far fewer games. There's teams that, there's teams that have only played conference schedules compared to teams that have played other games. So their strength of schedules way off and, you know, they're, they're doing whatever they can to get the seeding right. But uh, back to, I mean, back to the big South there, I did say 
the six seed should be favored on the road over the three seed. And lo and behold, they're a one point favorite. So I'm hoping for Gardner. I didn't bet them. I'm not doubling down, but I do have some Gardner Webb 10 to one to win the big South. And then, uh, yeah, the Longwood UNC Asheville game, you can have that. I probably won't even pay attention. That's a, that's not a very, not a game I'm interested in anyway. Uh, the Asheville. And that was, that was interesting too. Some of the odds that came out, made Asheville the second favorite, even though they were on the same side of the bracket as uh, a favorite. So it's it's been perplexing a little, to say the least, because I think uh, the, the seating is going to be a little goofy this year, and it's going to fool some people. So definitely don't just, you know, and that, that's obvious advice, don't just look at the team's ranking or seating and just make bets based on that. But <laughs> dig in a little on there, because the seating is going to get way out of whack on some of these teams that are going to use net. Andy, that's that's some great advice. I'm actually going to talk about net a little bit uh, because I was asked about it on a podcast last week and I told him I had no idea what was going on. So I've been digging into it. Let's just say it's better than RPI. And uh, let's just also say it's not perfect. So I think that's going to be a way to find some value, like you said, right? Um, oh, yeah. A six seed being a favorite on the road. I think we're going to see some of that as, as good as, as the selection committee has gotten a lot better for the NCAA tournament, but net ain't perfect. And that's where you're going to find some weird stuff. Um, when it's all said and done with a field of 68. Uh, can we move on to the horizon? Um, they're starting on Tuesday. Uh, do you see any value in, in any of these teams to win the horizon league tournament? Yeah, they did some playing on that. The other, this is one of the ones that really spreads out. They were actually the first one to start. They played like a couple games, just like, you know, the pigtails on the bracket to see who gets into the, the main part of the bracket. So I do have an outright on Detroit. They're a pick em versus uh, Northern Kentucky. So I'm hopefully they can get through. And then I think I have some, oh, I have some Oakland as well. Oakland is favored over Youngstown state. That's one I'm, I'm hoping I get a couple teams to move on here because there's some, it's another one where you're going to have a lot of these, where there's a, a team or two, even in a field of 12, where they're going to be less than even odds to win the tournament. You know, there's, there's been times where there's teams in these smaller ones that are, you know, Vermont was minus 500 last year to win their tournament before they even played a game. Yeah, you'll you'll have stuff like that where there are just massive favorites. So I'm I'm hoping to fade some of those in some situations, especially in a, a wonky year like this where maybe teams are a little underrated. So hopefully I can get Detroit and Oakland to move on and have a couple semifinalists in that. And then the other you know the other two games are the favorites, Cleveland State and Wright State. I don't think there's odds up right now. I kind of pencil whipped my own numbers what i feel like they should open at tomorrow so i mean both of those teams are going to be double digit maybe 12 to 15 point favorites so they're likely moving on versus some lower seeds and hopefully my uh my 10 to ones can move on in that uh, conference as well all right some good sweats in i like this this is good now you're talking about some teams that are prohibitively favorite that is not the case in the atlantic 10 where you got four teams at the top you got st louis at plus 250 vcu plus 250 st bonaventure is plus 350 in richmond the spiders four to one any value there for you andy this tournament getting underway on wednesday anything standing out to you for the a10 this is one where i looked at the conference uh bracket early this morning too and it's another one where there's odds up, but they don't have all the seating in place yet. So I think I, and my numbers like Richmond, I've been on Richmond a few times. I know some very smart people who like Richmond before the season. Obviously some things have changed on that team, but I think, I mean, you're right. It, there is a, a glut of like five, six teams at the top that are not too far off from each other. And Richmond at like four to one, I think I like, but I think I like to wait because like I said, the first two seeds are set and then a bunch of the bottom seeding is set, but it looks like, and don't quote me on this because the, again, there was some convoluted math on how they were going to, how they were going to decide who's the seeding here, but the top four seeds would get uh, the double buy in the Atlantic 10. And there's a decent chance Richmond ends up with the five seed oh. and would have to play an extra game albeit versus like George Washington or St. Joe's like very low, low end teams where they would play a warm up game before they played the four seed, which would be uh you know, another team that'd be close to them. And I do think if they end up dropping to the five seed and having to play that extra game, I think the odds might go up. So I think if you are betting Richmond, you might even get a better number 
later on. Whereas I think if they win and end up in the four seed, it, it might not uh, change all that much because four to one's probably kind of right where it should be. So I, I do like the spiders, but uh, I'm going to wait and see how these I'm a game or two left, I guess, before we decide all the seating here. Do you feel like an accountant trying to figure out all these like these seating formulas that are being out there? Like, I feel like that's just an extra, another additional obstacle thrown into everything this year. Do you feel like you've just gotten all of your mathematics out of the way for the year, trying to calculate who will be seated where? Yeah, I mean, a quote from, and this is just the the Wikipedia page that threw it together on on this tournament. But basically, it said they're they're going to seed them by winning percentage within the conference, which yeah, real standard, like conference <laughs> yeah. winning percentage. That's right. But then that it sounds says good. Any team that does not play above 60% of the median number of conference games played by the other members will be seeded by their net ranking within the conference. So, like, if you didn't play enough conference games above the median, 60% above the median. So, yeah, we're, we're getting, we're delving into a little more math than people are probably used to as far as <laughs> just, and this is just to get to the seeding for a tournament. So, yeah, I, I feel like my head is spinning on some of these. But in the end, that's why I started doing these tournament previews a couple years ago was I was just always so confused about why like the Gonzaga to the West Coast Conference why does Gonzaga not play for like a week and a half here and you go look and the oh they do triple buys or you know this team this (laughs) conference recedes after the first two rounds there's so many you know idiosyncrasies and changes so and, you know, after two years of like, all right, now I know how the Big South does things. And then like, ah, we're going to change it because of this weird year. So I guess I will just keep on learning. That sounds good. Andy, are there any other teams in some of the smaller conferences that you like uh, this week? So I did look ahead. And again, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you know, I, I'm not able to get odds terribly early, which sucks because I really wish I could just start digging into these. But there's four more smaller conferences that do start on Wednesday, the Ohio Valley, the ASUN, the Patriots, and one more, it looks like, oh, the, the Atlantic 10 that we just spoke about. But uh, the Ohio Valley, there's a couple teams at the top. I'm probably looking to fade those because I think Jacksonville State and Eastern Kentucky are nearly as good if i can get some big numbers on them you know just like anything else it's all going to be price dependent if i if i get a decent price in eastern kentucky i like them quite a bit uh the the a sun might be one of those where it's it's liberty and nobody like liberty is going to be a big favorite they're very good they have i mean bellarmine is a decent team they're right there but it might be liberty and nobody so i have seen in the past team or books offering two-way props on that we're like will liberty win it or not uh, like with the vermont you know, i've seen that so maybe one of those where i can just take the field or pass completely in the a sun and then the the patriot is interesting because navy is a team i actually bet on yesterday even though they were missing multiple players and their head coach due to contact tracing so they're a very good team but now i, I feel like i need to dig in and make sure like, are those players coming back? What's right. uh, what's happening? Are we are we getting the whole squad back? Are they gonna? You know, sometimes these contact tracing situations get out of control, and all of a sudden, oh, here's three more players that are missing. <laughs> so, if you know, if one of the top teams is going to be missing coaches and players heading into a tournament here, I think uh, some deeper diving on some other teams needs to happen. Uh, deep dive, a uh, perfect drop there for you as oh, well. Yeah, so look at that. <laughs> with the deep dive podcast. Now we don't want to just limit you, Andy, to just the mid majors. So we also got some other conference posted over a FanDuel Sportsbook too. Any of those standing out to you, or uh, are you mostly focusing on the mid majors here? No, I usually play some futures on all those. I've had some fun hits over the years, but uh, yeah, the SEC is impossible. I don't know what to do with that. Like, yeah, Bama's good, but then they go out and. And then the same thing goes for the Pac-12. Like, I guess I, I could make a case for Arkansas and Oregon at some, like, three, three and a half prices. But those are big tournaments. You know, They those are bigger conferences. That's what I experienced when I dug into the A-10. You know, I'd been looking at some small conferences. It's like, here's our nice little eight-team bracket. And then you get into these and, like, oh, yeah, 14 teams and playing <laughs> games and everybody plays a bunch. And it does get a little more complicated. So I think when you start digging into the, the bigger conferences, too you do have to give a shot to some of these teams it's like you're you're a hard bubble team right now like you need to win a couple games whereas you know there's nobody in the big south that's going to get in strictly on their merits by winning two or three games and losing in the finals like oh they're they made a good run at it whereas you know these sec there's teams for sure that are on the bubble so i i 
I had circled Arkansas a little. I wish that number were a touch bigger. Again, got to look at brackets and the same with Oregon. And then Mountain West, baby, it's uh, Colorado State. Everybody's talking. Everybody, all my, all my guys at Met College Basketball are talking me into that one. I haven't dug into it yet, but I might just place one to ride with the gang. <laughs> Colorado <laughs> State plus 480 over at FanDuel yeah. Sportsbook for the Mountain West. So uh, we'll have some fun and tag along there. That is Andy Molitor. Make sure you check him out on BetSperts and also on the Deep Dive podcast as well. Remember, you can find, follow him over at BetSperts uh, under the name of Andy. Andy, we appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Good luck to you, not just this week, but next week into the tournament as well. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again here soon. Yeah, thanks, guys. Good luck to you, too. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Andy Molitor for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on the mid-major men's college basketball tournaments. Make sure you check him out over at BetSports, where he is the director of content. You can get his uh, free analysis there and follow Andy on Twitter at AndyMSFW. And Ed, one of the things Andy discussed was some of these conferences setting their seating based on net. You said that you were researching nets. I'm curious, what did your research find when you were looking into net? Well, I was, I was on an Indiana podcast last week and they asked me about net and I'd actually never really looked into it before. So I felt <laughs> a little bit embarrassed, but then we're in the time of year where net's pretty important because this is what the committee uses, uh, to evaluate teams. And, um, I, I'm only so useful to people, right? If I can't kind of dig into the analytics that other people use. Um, anyways, I decided to dig in a little bit and, Oh, and the other reason I decided to dig in is because, like, trying to bet college basketball this time of year is completely frustrating. Uh, I talked a little bit about, you know, trying to find some value in Indiana against Michigan. That line was, like, seven and a half, eight, like, perfectly accounted for kind of the situation against Michigan. Kind of wanted to uh, – Virginia's lost three straight games, wanted to bet them tonight against Miami. Nah, 14 and a half is just about perfect. So that's 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 partially why I'm talking about net right now. So – um, so there's two components to net. There's there's an efficiency component that looks at points per possession, and then there's something called the team value index, which is something that essentially values wins over teams. And from what I can tell, like you know, in the official net page on the NCAA.com, they don't break it up into the two parts. But what I'm expecting is that the efficiency component is going to look a lot like my team rankings that you can get at thepowerrank.com. Data from this season, adjusted for strength of schedule, um, that component's going to look like what I have. Now, you might be saying, Ed, well, you know, you're not doing points possession on your points per possession on your public thing. Uh, shouldn't you look at Ken Palm for that? And you should go look at Ken Palm because he does a great job. But the thing about Ken Palm is that he still has a preseason component in what he's doing. Uh, that's the only way you can have Colgate 92nd right now. Because when you when you actually just use the data from this year, because they've only played 11 games, I think they end up being top five when, when you run the numbers on this year. So so anyways, he's got a little bit of a, a preseason component. You can look at my rankings to kind of get basically that aspect of the net. And then you can kind of look at the difference between the total net and what I have to figure out what this team value index is. And. You know, it's essentially something that is valuing wins. And so teams in the Big Ten that are, you know, pretty good and are going to look pretty good by efficiency, they're going to get docked by that. So, for example, like 19th is 19th. <laughs> Wisconsin is 19th in my team rankings. So this takes margin of victory and adjust for schedule. It's, it's going to be roughly equivalent to the efficiency numbers. Um, in net, they're 24th. So they're getting docked for not having won more games in a big in a Big Ten schedule that that's pretty hard. You look at the difference is even bigger with a team like Indiana. So they're forty they're forty third in my points based numbers. They're fifty seventh in net. So net has definitely helped the committee get better at seeding, and we saw that kind of the first year that it happened. It's far from perfect in terms of predicting the outcome of college basketball games. So that that's certainly a little bit frustrating, but you know, it's not it's not supposed to be like a betting tool, right? I mean, it's supposed to be something that helps the committee. And in some sense, valuing wins is is putting that in there is saying like uh, which teams deserve to be there because they've won games. So that's the component that goes into there. And so it's going to underrate teams in very difficult conferences like the Big Ten. And that's what you see. So um, so anyways, that's my quick breakdown of net right now. Um, and uh, yeah. If you have any questions, let me know. 
Do you think that will lead to situations in the tournament where we may be, like a term we use in Daily Fantasy is stacking, where you will bump up, you know, a quarterback with his wide receiver and stuff like that. Or in NASCAR, if I want to stack the Fords or stack the Toyotas, something like that. Do you, could you see a situation where you just go in with the assumption that the Big Ten is underrated by something by the seeding and have Big Ten teams inherently outperform their seeding? Could you see a situation like that arising as a result of the way that net formulates its 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 formula? Yeah, for sure. I think, it, well, I mean, Indiana's kind of really teetering on the bubble right now, but if they win some games and they make it, uh, yeah, that's definitely a team that that I think they're talented enough to win some games. They will have essential home court advantage in the state of Indi- Indiana. And so you're looking at a team like Purdue, too, that that's going to have that that home court advantage. I mean, a lot of the teams in the Big Ten aren't going to have to travel that right. far. So you could have that as well. Um, I'm definitely thinking about kind of some sweet 16 futures, maybe uh, for those types of teams. But, yeah, those are the teams that are going to be misseeded by the committee. And I think it's helpful to know the way that the brackets are set, the way that the seating is set so you can try to exploit it, because you can't take exploit if you don't know how it's set. So glad you yep. dug in net. I think that's a useful conversation to have and something we'll certainly be discussing on our NCAA tournament podcast coming up. That is actually two weeks from today. Now that will be live on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Periscope page. We'll be breaking down the brackets as they come out, letting you know how you can set your brackets. So make sure you're subscribed to the FanDuel YouTube page. Be there live at 6 p.m. Eastern that Monday the 15th to get you set to fill out your brackets. Now, for my covering the future, because college basketball, not my forte, sticking with baseball, because the first spring training games were yesterday. It was uh, nice to get excited about spring training, then realize the Twins were not on TV for whatever reason. It's 2021. We still can't get all the spring training games televised. I'm not mad. But I want to go back to the MLB Division of Winners, because we talked with the Mets to win the NL East two weeks ago. And this week, I'm going to stick with the NL. But I want to go to this central because it's uh, I think it's more wide open than it's being built. And I want to bet the Brewers uh, at plus 380 to win the NL Central. Most of this is because FanDuel loves the Cardinals. They're minus 105 to win the central. And I think that's a healthy amount too short. The main issue that I have is the starting pitching for the Cardinals. They rank 35th uh, in the 35th percentile there based on my priors going into the year before their rotation after Jack Flaherty. You've got a lot of shakiness with this rotation. A lot of guys need to hit the high end of the range of outcomes. And when you're banking on that with four separate guys, that's a pretty tough proposition for me to buy into. I'm also not entirely sold on their offense, even with Nolan Arenado being in town. If you look at just what their current active roster did last year, which includes Arenado, they rank 27th in WRC+. Plus. You can get that data from Fangraphs.com. Arenado, a down year last year, so you'd bump them up from 27th, and my numbers do bump them up because they factor in 2019 as well. So they're better than 27th in WRC+, Plus, but they're not great. Now, the Brewers are not good offensively either. They rank 25th based on last year's WRC+, Plus, their active roster, but they are better in other areas than the Cardinals are. They have arguably the league's best bullpen. They also have a better starting rotation. May not be ideal, but uh, instead of having just one Flaherty, they have two guys who are really good starters in Brandon Woodruff and Corbin Burns. The rest of the rotation after those two guys is heavily dependent on balls in play, and that's scary because yeah, as, a, as a pitcher once described to me, your fielders can't mess up. He didn't say mess, but the, your, your fielders can't mess up if you get a strikeout. They're not going to get a lot of strikeouts, but it helps that the defender's pretty good this year with Colton Wong coming into play second base. Kesson Hero really struggled defensively at second base last year. Now he is over at first base. That's a big plus for those non-elite starters they have in their rotation to get better defense behind them. So basically, I think the Brewers are a team that's going to play a lot of low-scoring games this year, and that means that they're going to be involved in a lot of games. It does require them to take advantage of, you know, close games, which is a high-variance, very volatile approach, but when they're plus 380 to win the division, I'm okay with that. The Cardinals being overvalued to me is creating value elsewhere in this market, and that says to me the Brewers are the team best positioned to take advantage of that. So I'll plug them at plus 380 to win the NL Central and just kind of more so being lower 
on the Cardinals and consensus. You could take that to bet the under on their win total, but I think the the more value esque way to approach this is to bet the Brewers to win the NL Central at plus three eighty. Now, Ed, you were talking about watching college basketball, watch a little golf. I'm going to guess there's no spring training on the Feng TV, correct? <laughs> there's not. I tried to even like track the Twins game on MLB.com yesterday. You yeah. know, I was excited because my guy, my guy, Byron Buxton was about to bat, and go. it got frozen. Uh-oh. They like stopped tracking the game in the fourth inning when Buxton was supposed to bat. So I kept like refreshing the page, and I could have just searched Twitter, but I'm very lazy, so I decided not to. And spring training can be very frustrating. I don't understand why we can't have at least a feed at every game. They have audio feeds, but like, I don't know. I just uh. I'm annoyed with spring training already. So no better way to kick off the 2021 MLB season than being annoyed at MLB. That is all the time that we have for today here on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Andy Molitor for swinging by and breaking down these men's college basketball mid-major conference tournaments. Check him out on Twitter at AndyMSFW. Check him out on the Deep Dive podcast and also check him out at BetSperts and see all of his good work there. Ed, we already talked about the podcast. Reminder, where can people find that podcast and all of your work? Yeah, The Bracket Wisdom is a series on my podcast, The Football Analytics Show. There's short episodes, about 10 minutes every day, every weekday from now until the start of the tournament. So go check that out at The Football Analytics Show. And then uh, in my email newsletter, you'll get my March Madness cheat sheet. Uh, just basically makes it drop that easy for you to fill out your bracket. You can get that at thepowerank.com. All righty. Uh, make sure you follow Ed on Twitter as well at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. Make sure you follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We'll have more men's college basketball thoughts next week here on Covering the Spread. So make sure you subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you are subscribed. Leave us a rating or review as well. And again, our uh, bracket show coming up. Monday, 6 p.m. on March 15th. The Ides of March, what could go wrong? Talking men's college basketball on March 15th. But that'll be on the FanDuel YouTube page, so make sure you're subscribed there as well. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you as you are betting these men's college basketball tournaments. We'll talk to you once again next week for more tourney talk. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.